Hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to be uh, here today. Um, I called what I'm going to talk about a toolkit for primary geography. Um, one of the things which I say sometimes is that uh, I feel that I'm an accidental geographer in the sense that I was sort of drawn into it. I, my background is as a primary school teacher and a secondary school teacher, and I worked for uh, quite a number of years in an educational charity concerned with uh, uh, the urban environment. Uh, I'm currently uh, a visiting reader in sustainability and education at, a, at the Canterbury Christchurch University in Canterbury in the UK. And for years, <laughs> rather too many years, I've been uh, deeply involved with the Geographical Association and the, the GA Geographical Association has a rotating system of presidents. So I was president for uh, the year 2018-19, uh, which was a, a great privilege and uh, something which uh, uh, was a, a wonderful experience. Uh, you'll see from the picture that I put up that uh, I'm, I'm going to argue that uh, geography is a really dynamic and exciting subject. Quite a few of you will probably be able to locate yourself on that uh, on that picture or image of the world, certainly Korea and India and China and maybe Singapore is just sort of slightly obliterated at the bottom, but uh, uh, looking at pictures like that draws you in to this uh, dynamic and exciting subject. And maybe this is the time to say that if you look at uh, the word geography, uh, etymologically, if you trace it back to its roots, it, it, its root is a Greek root, geographia, geo meaning earth, and graphia meaning representation, writing, images, and so on. So earth images or earth writing is what the Greeks thought of as geography. And in many ways, that's a pretty good definition of what geography is today, that it's about uh, telling the story of the world as it is. And if that is what geography is about, then surely that is something that is absolutely essential for all of us. So what I'm going to do in the talk is just to explore a little bit uh, uh, about uh, a little bit more about what geography is about. I'm going to have a section on maps because everybody's interested in geography and mapping. Um, there's the old adage that geography is about maps and history is about chaps. Um, so maps and map work is something which I think we, we need to say a bit about. I'm also going to look a little bit at outdoor work and inquiries and curriculum organisation and planning and finish up with something on resources. And your questions are really welcome because that's where uh, we can get the dialogue going and it enables uh, me to delve a little bit deeper into the things which I will find that you've wanted me to talk about. So on to the first slide, hopefully. Uh, which way do we go? Uh, I'm not moving at all. There we go, right. Um, my first uh, uh, contention is that in one way or another, uh, we are all geographers and in, we need to be able to negotiate and find our way around and that's something that happens and that ability happens at a very early age. Um, there was a famous uh, well-known article for those of us who delve into these sort of things some years ago which uh, declared that geography was the uh, fourth, fourth ace in the pack of cards. The fourth ace after oracy, numeracy and literacy comes uh, graphicacy or the ability to navigate in space because we all need to know, know where we are, how to get around, what's around about us. This is a little uh, extract from a well-known and much loved uh, piece of literature, Sided with Rosie by Laurie Lee, in which he describes at age three his first understanding of the world around him. Radiating from that house with its crumbling walls, I moved along paths that lengthened inch by inch with my mounting strength of days. I enlarged my world and mapped it in my mind, its secure havens, its dust deserts and puddle, and its peaks of dirt and flag flying bushes. The idea that he's enlarging his world at age three, I think that's what we all do, and geography enables us to enlarge our world as adults. It's a lifelong process and an exciting and an enjoyable one. Now, the last 18 months, 15 months or whatever has been pretty traumatic for many of us and lockdown is a theme which is, change, is going to change and is changing how education is conducted. But I just want to share a poem with you uh, from uh, a local school child aged nine, Lonely, Lonely Lockdown. Uh, that's the key stanza, but I'll read you the whole poem. Who would have thought 
that in the darkest of times, light could be sought. Imagination is something what isn't broken, something that you have. And here's the poem, the line here. Who would have thought, even though we were stuck at home, we had worldwide adventures. I went to Africa, slept in a tent in Antarctica. I sailed the Atlantic looking for colorful fish just by sitting in a chair. I want to be grateful for the things we have. Friends are suddenly like treasure. Never before were they so important. The lockdown has changed the world. Let's hope it will finish, at least hope. So the world of imagination from Laurie Lee as a three-year-old to this uh, local school child traveling the Atlantic with looking for colorful fish. I think that gives you a, an idea of why maybe I'm so excited about geography. So my next slide is a rem just a reminder that we live on a planet of great uh, uh, diversity with a remarkable range of flora and fauna. Now we know that that flora and fauna has been uh, under immense pressure at the current time and we're seeing, uh, 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 we've got absolutely uh, uh, major problems with uh, 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 biodiversity and, and uh, biodiversity loss. But despite that, the wonders of nature are an inspiration for children and for adults and for all, and not only as an inspiration, but they also provide, uh, uh, as, and we've discovered particularly in lockdown, that immersing ourselves in nature is good for our mental health, it's good for our sense of uh, security. Uh, we need uh, our sense of belonging uh, is vested in the environment around about us. But that remarkable planet on which we live is something that we can celebrate. And I think that geography can celebrate the world around us in a really meaningful way. Um, some of you may have come across David Orr, who writes about uh, the middle years of childhood. But he uh, argues that we should allow children to uh, enjoy the world. And he makes a plea, he says, if we're going to find out about what's happening to the world, that's fine. But please, no disasters in the classroom before the age of nine. Let's celebrate it first. And then once we've got that ethic of care and that sense of uh, that it matters, then we can begin to find out how it's changing and some of the uh, bad news stories and equally some of the good news stories about what we can do about it. So this idea that the physical setting is fundamental to geography, not only the flora and fauna, but also the rocks and soil. This is the opening page actually of the Collins primary geography for the junior year. So that's aimed at year three. And you can see on the left hand side, the surface of the moon contrasted with the surface of the earth. And then on the right, I hope it's that way around on your screen. Uh, uh, you can see the satellite image. The, it's actually a, a photograph that's been heavily doctored because apart from anything else, there are no clouds and you could never have a picture like that. And the desert isn't a uniform yellow or even yellows and browns, it's all sorts of different colors. It's been uh, nicely colored in with sort of electronic watercolors and I'm certain the sea isn't a uniform blue, but that apart, it, it is one of these wonderful modern images that shows us the world in and, and, and the surface of the world in great detail and draws you in just like that picture did uh, earlier on that I used on the opening slide. So the physical setting is one side of geography, and that is usually sort of set against or set alongside the human, social, human environment. And so the second point is, not only do we live on a remarkable planet, we live on a crowded planet. And if I was talking about population, I could show graphs and so on, showing the way in which world population has escalated over the decades and over the years. Um, it's the stunning fact is, that there are three times more people living on the planet today as there were when I was born uh, 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 some 50, uh, so, sorry, 65 years ago. And so a huge increase in human numbers. And that increase, it looks like it's going to tail off and it is off, but uh, uh, it's got, there's many more millions of people, many more billions of people who are going to be living on the planet uh, by the time we get to the end of the century if the predictions are uh, fulfilled as it were. So we live on a crowded planet. So finding out about the people and the conditions that the people live in, as well as the uh, nature of the planet itself are the two sides of geography. Uh, you can explore that in lots of different ways. This is from the Junior Atlas, which uh, is one of many maps that you can find showing population distribution 
And again, the first thing you probably want to do is to home in and say, oh, that's where I am. I can see uh, Malta. Well, just about, uh, probably not very, very tiny dot there. So you'll want a bigger map for that. We turn over the next page and take it from there. Uh, but you'll uh, also see the pattern. Um, and we are crowded together. Uh, about two thirds or more of the Earth's surface is water. Uh, and if you look at the land, a large amount of the land is actually more or less uninhabitable. So if you take out the deserts, if you take out uh, the ice caps and Antarctica's not shown there, uh, you've, you find that people are crowded together on about a third of the dry land and the dry land is about a third of the Earth's surface. So only about a, a ninth or a tenth of the Earth's surface is effectively uh, uh, where all the people that we find in that picture and all the people we can expect to find in the years to come are going to be living. So again, this takes us into spatial distributions and so on and begins to uh, uh, make us begin to question, well, what next? How's this going to change? Is that map going to be the same? And so on. So people and cities, uh, at human side of geography. So putting those two to get together, two branches, the physical and the human, uh, and there's a, di a diagram showing uh, some of the topics. And that's something I, I sometimes do with both teachers and with uh, students to say, what are the various topics that you associate with uh, geography? And you've got some which are very clearly physical geography, like rivers, hurricanes, soils, but you've also got some which are very uh, obviously human geography, like trade and population. And then you've got the overlap area, which takes us increasingly into the environmental issues, where you might be thinking about energy or conservation, migration, and those sort of words. And uh, those two uh, circles in that diagram can be either further apart or closer together. And there are some, some of us arguing, uh, I might be one of them, uh, to say that the division between physical and human may have been useful in the past, but actually it is the inability of geography to integrate, uh, which makes it uh, such a special subject and such a valuable one. So that's um, just a sort of uh, introduction. It's a synthesis subject. It draws together ideas from all sorts of different places and puts them together in telling the story of the world. And that story can be told at a local level, or it can be told at a global level, or it can be told at both levels. And it's the interactions uh, which bring that together. So a very quick, quick pause now. Um, can you just maybe if you've got a moment either now or in uh, the chat as we go along, think of a geography, uh, a, a teacher or a person who inspired you with enthusiasm for geography, or more like negatively, was there a moment or somebody who uh, uh, rather turned you off it and made you think, no, this isn't a subject for me. I just wondered whether there's somebody who stands out, if you just sort of uh, a quick sentence in the chat box, which uh, uh, Sh Charlene will probably pick up. I think Charlene, we can pick these up uh, later on maybe. Yes, it's definitely. It's up to you, uh, depends on what comes in to some extent as well, because there may be live questions uh, which you want to pick up. So I, I'm leaving that to your discretion. Okay, so if you if you want to um, type it into the box and then when we pause for another reflection, I can bring that up to you, Stephen, so people right. have a chance to type that in. Mm -hmm. so, so, yes. I certainly can think of uh, teachers who I, uh, there were certainly teachers who really did inspire me <clears throat> and I can hold that then at very <clears throat> high esteem. I can also think of some teachers who made me think that geography was the most boring subject in the world. <laughs> but you thread your way through. But when, <clears throat> when we did an exercise like this with the uh, trustees of the Geographical Association, <clears throat> and we said to each other, well, what is it that brought us to that room? What is it that brought, about 16 of us, brought us to that place? About half said it was a teacher. It was a teacher who had inspired them. And I think that's a really important message because it is, you know, that says something about our roles as teachers and the importance of, our, of, what, of what we can do. We don't always know what seeds we're sowing. So that's uh, moving on then, uh, while that's going on, uh, to think a little bit more about maps. I'm going to start by showing some children's maps of uh, places which they, in their roundabout them, which they think are meaningful or important. Now, my first one is an eight year old. My map shows some of the places I like to visit. If you look at that, you can see bottom left my house. Uh, there's the garden, there's a dog or cat or whatever, a couple of animals. Uh, there's a McDonald's, uh, the, the, going up the right to the top right, we come to a playground. Uh, and then 
we eventually get to Sainsbury's. Uh, that's uh, Caitlin's world, and the one that's the one that she uh, treasures. Now, interestingly, uh, that's a perfectly good map as far as I'm concerned. A map is a working definition, a picture of a place, and that certainly gives me an idea of, of a place and the places that she treasures and values and thinks are important in her life. Um, all shown in side view. I very much doubt if her house has a chimney with smoke coming out of it, that's sort of iconic. Uh, so it's sort of, it's both symbolic and real as it were. Uh, but interestingly, the key thing is the clouds and the sky. Uh, so uh, many children right through the primary school years, right up to age 11, will want to put the sun in the top right hand corner or whatever, and some of them will want to show the, the sky, because that common sense world with the sky and the sun above us, and the earth underneath, firm beneath our feet, is that is the world that we live in. And uh, there's nothing, I've, I've got, um, I'm very sort of uh, uh, broad-minded, as it were, when it comes to maps. Uh, there are lots of different ways of drawing them, and they're all, in many ways, they're all valid in their own terms. It's all a question of what you want to show and what they're being used for. I don't think I could find my way around with that map, but it, that's not really quite what it's trying to do. Here's another map from a seven-year-old, again, uh, all shown in side view, a little bit of smoke coming out of the chimney there. My map is from my house to school. I like going swimming because it cheers me up when I'm down. This is the emotional development, as it were, the emotional, uh, 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 it, the environment round about us is, is vested with all sorts of memories, all sorts of associations, and that's what makes it meaningful. It's not just out there, it's the relationship between you, the child, and the environment which makes it meaningful. I go to dance because it's been my dream to dance. I go to the park to chill out. I go to school to meet friends and to learn. So three places or four places which uh, uh, that seven-year-old values. And then one more, and this makes an enormously important point for me about the diversity that you can expect within any cohort of children. My map shows lots of houses and roads because I like walking down streets and seeing the roads. Now that map, uh, which is more or less all drawn in plan view is an incredibly accurate um, representation of the uh, of the area in which uh, Theo lives. You can see there's a, a detailed key on the right. Um, that is sort of a forensic detail. Few of the buildings that are, like the school and, the, uh, and some of my house are shown in profile, but a lot of it is shown uh, in plan. And what I could certainly find my way around with that that, that's a very interesting way of showing the area around about you. So, as I say, the diversity is one of the things which you might uh, reasonably expect uh, from a group of children. And this last one, here's Daisy. My map shows the street where I live, and I chose this because it's my favourite place in the world. Uh, whatever their environment, however ordinary it's, it, it appears, we're uh, running a project at the moment on children's maps. We've got an archive of about 500. And uh, nearly all of them, just about every one, uh, uh, is celebrating the place where they live and saying we like the place we live in, even although you know, sort of warts and all, it may not be perfect. Uh, and of course, Daisy here's uh, done the classic thing where you, you've got a problem when you're showing things in elevation. What do you do when you get to the other side of the street? Well, the answer is you turn the paper around and draw everything upside down. And uh, again, I could identify all those buildings. I could find my way around the high street without any problem with the, that wonderful drawing. So the idea that <clears throat> our, our maps uh, meld with pictures, uh, they are pictures of places, uh, that talking with children about what their map shows is really important because everything they put on their picture or on their map will be significant in one way or another, and it's very easy to overlook that. So those are the sort of things which those, we call these sort of informal maps uh, in the sense that they're not obeying uh, uh, commonly agreed rules, uh, but they are uh, uh, part of the vibrant and uh, wonderful range of responses which enable children to uh, uh, tell you something about the places which they value. And that is, again, very much part of our local area work in geography. Now, moving on uh, to world knowledge, what do children know about the world map? What can we expect them to learn about the world map? I'll just share a few thoughts about that. 
as we go along. So naming countries um, is very useful to have a, a globe in the classroom. This is a simple blow up globe that, that you can get these for uh, in England, certainly for just a few pounds or probably in other countries for similarly, uh, you know, sort of five pounds or that much amount of money will get you a perfectly adequate one, but uh, you can get bigger ones, you can get ones which are just outlines and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, they're brilliant, globes are brilliant for showing the spinning of the earth and, uh, uh, and, and showing the roundness of the earth. Uh, they're not so good for uh, finding out where places are, but you can find out where countries are, obviously. So about uh, what do children, what countries do children know of or have heard of at age seven? Well, typically uh, five or six, would, would you might, that's five-year-olds actually, uh, typically you might expect that sort of number, and there will be the, the countries which they've visited or the countries which are nearby. And clearly some of you working in international schools we may have children, even that, uh, very young children, who will be, exceed that sort of number. It all depends on your circumstances. Moving onwards uh, to 11 year olds, a, a huge increase, number of countries has increased uh, to 15 to 30. But again, there will, you could expect considerable diversity within any particular cohort. And um, that is uh, uh, the way things are. And uh, what I suppose one of the things which we might bear in mind is uh, as long as we can see uh, a growth in world map knowledge, uh, that's what you're heading for. Uh, is there a reasonable expectation about what children should and shouldn't know at 11 or indeed seven or whatever? Um, well, yes, I think that the point about naming countries is uh, if you can associate the country, not just with a name, but start uh, knowing something about it. So you're learning about it in context, then that becomes much more uh, meaningful. And that was what I'd say about map skills. If you're talking about map skills, learning them in context where you're trying to communicate something the child's going to tell you something in this case about France or whatever, then that becomes important. One of the other things is uh, just the sheer amount of information that we throw at children. Now this is from the Collins Atlas and uh, it's the Collins Junior Atlas and what we've tried to do there is to show a reasonably uh, uh, a comprehensive uh, map of Europe uh, which children will be able to answer the question well where's this country and what's its capital but it's jolly difficult to do because it, it, the real world's messy and you get lots of countries of different sizes and the very small ones won't quite fit in. So you have to have a key and so on. Uh, and we can't show all the capital cities and uh, we, you begin to realize that you've got to make compromises. Uh, one of the other things is, although we've tried to keep the amount of information under control, there is a lot of text on there a lot of difficult words for children to read, a lot of words which will be unfamiliar with children, uh, to children. If you just take uh, the background off, as it were, and look at the, the text, this is what they're confronted with. It's a real minefield, isn't it? And these are insecure readers, age eight, age nine, age 10, they may still be struggling uh, to decode what the, what the, uh, the uh, labels are actually telling us. And, and of course, they're written in different fonts, they're written in different Si uh, uh, uppercase, lowercase, some of them are sideways, some of them are horizontal and so on, and some of them intersect. So a lot of information to cope with. If you do a total there, something like 80 bits of text, and that's pretty, that's a pretty simple map. So we need to be aware of the, uh, that this isn't going, learning to use an atlas isn't going to be something that happens quickly. It's something that requires uh, uh, developed over time and uh, as I say, if you can use it in context, then uh, that will be a real benefit. Uh, if you give people or children the opportunity to draw a map of the world on their own, as it were, and say, here's a blank piece of paper, draw me a map, uh, you may get a, a, a range of responses. Uh, we'll look at this a little bit more in a moment, but you may well find you just get uh, floating territories. So the one on the left is what we call an island map, uh, and you'll see there that uh, the blobs are Scotland, China, Italy, America, Switzerland, France, they're all sort of floating around and they're not connected or uh, in any sort of spatial relationship. The alternative is uh, there's a tendency to try and get your countries towards the edge where they're secure, so they act as a sort of border. Uh, and that one, that long thin uh, country in the middle is Italy, and you've got uh, uh, Britain, England at the top, uh, 
uh, uh, with Ireland to the left. So the, something which is recognisable, but they're still floating around. Uh, fascinating stuff looking at children's maps. Uh, Patrick Vigand uh, has done some work on this and is, uh, identifies uh, five stages uh, of world map knowledge, starting from those island maps, those isolated units, uh, moving on stage two to units of different sizes, and then uh, stage three uh, to recognizing that even within territories of different sizes, there might be borders and so on, differentiated shapes at stage three, increasing accuracy on stage four uh, to a what would look like a pretty good formal map of the world at stage five, where you can see very clearly on the left hand side, North and South America, Africa, and so on in the center, and Europe uh, and Britain uh, in, in the center above it. So uh, five stages in world mapping, and it's that uh, uh, typology uh, which he um, established some 30 years ago has been tested out and has stood the test of time. So you, again, you can expect a whole range of uh, uh, diversity of responses, but to remember when we're talking about the world around us, uh, the world which children have of the map, the map, the world map that they carry in their heads may be very different from the world map that you carry in your head, and uh, equally the world map that child A has got may be quite different to the world map that uh, child B is carrying around. So to sum up, some map conventions, and these are need to be introduced to children during the primary school years in context and given lots of opportunities for children to practice. The first one is what should a map have? And this is a sort of check, quick check, checklist where it needs to have a title to say what the map is about. What is this map telling us? What is it communicating? Why have you decided to draw it in the first place? It needs labels and these labels may be on different, of different sizes which indicate the importance of the thing which is shown, maybe symbols as well. There could be a scale which indicates how much the map has been reduced in size. That's a very simple and neat way of talking about scale. Scale is simply how much has the map or the place that you've shown been shrunk in order to get it onto the piece of paper. To get uh, 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 British Isles onto a piece of paper you may want to shrink it five million times. It's an awful lot but if you want to get the world on a piece of paper you've got to shrink it by a hundred million times. That is the scale. Uh, the scale bar enables you to measure the distance from one place to another and to convert it into uh, back, back as it were. Uh, there's a key which tells you what the symbols stand for and uh, that again economizes on space. Uh, the symbols themselves are little pictures and you can add those in in different ways and different and color very typically used symbolically. Uh, I remember teaching secondary school children who were coming through to me aged, um, well they, uh, they were in year nine and some of them I realised after a bit, I got this question, please, sir, what does the blue mean on this map? And I thought, gosh, you know, if they haven't re recognised that blue is water, uh, that's, you know, that, that's something uh, that I'd really, really overlooked. So being sensitive to children's misconceptions and their lack of knowledge of their gaps and so on, really important. But obviously blue is conventionally used for water, uh, green for lowland, brown and purple. Uh, for higher land and so on. So uh, that's another type of symbol. We always try and put a compass point on it. Interestingly, again, um, the north point is uh, uh, often shown at the top of the map, but it doesn't have to be. And in fact, until the magnetic compass, well, well before the magnetic compass was invented and widely used, east was often shown at the top of the map, direction of uh, the Holy Land for those of us in this part of the world. Yeah, and equally the direction of sunlight, uh, sunrise. Uh, and um, there's no particular reason why north has to be at the top. That is the convention. Equally, there's a grid that helps you to locate places. And of course, latitude and longitude come in here. Simple alphanumeric grids with younger children and uh, latitude and longitude for older children. Lots of fun you can have with these. Lots of quizzes and games you can have, which will help to practice uh, map skills and map conventions. And lastly, uh, to recognise that uh, the map is drawn from an overhead perspective. And with very young children, you can start practising drawing and play around with drawing uh, things which are on a table or desk and drawing around the outline of a cup and all those sorts of things uh, uh, to introduce them to that idea of planned perspective. So those are some map con conventions which uh, uh, we need to negotiate, uh, at, but don't rush it uh, and, and keep it in context.
So just to pause for reflection, again, you might want to put something into the chat box. In what ways do you use maps in your everyday life? And uh, a sort of subsidiary or uh, alternative, can you think of any picture books or stories which use maps? Okay, so if you want to type in your your answers into the chat box or the Q&A box, that would be great. Um, going back to the previous question, Stephen, we've had a yeah. few answers on that. Oh, so, great. Great. Um, some people have said that their grade nine teacher inspires them. Um, some people have said that they actually were inspired by watching documentaries such as oh, National Geographic, Discovery yeah. Channel and the BBC. Um, I also, um, currently, not when I was studying geography, but currently I'm also really inspired by David Attenborough. I was going to say, that, that's one of the ones which has inspired me, absolutely stunning, some of the photography, isn't it? Yes. yes. Um, so yeah, there are a few answers from the previous question. Um, oh, and great. Well, thank you. Thank you, those who, you, there's no obligation to type anything, but it's just an um, opportunity to, to reflect. Uh, and while we pause here, um, I think that something like a third of the internet searches on, on, on the internet are in some way spatially related. Uh, maps, uh, finding out where you are, knowing where you are, <laughs> whenever I'm on, in the days when I used to travel by train, the first thing you heard from the annoying person that, uh, sitting opposite was, I'm on the train, I'm just about to go into the tunnel, I'll be, you know, it's, it's all locational information. Uh, about Absolutely. where you are in the world and of course uh, one of the things nowadays uh, is that we use uh, uh, we use my neighbours just coming down the road and I wave to them uh, we <laughs> we use uh, postcodes enormously uh, and postcode location enables us to pinpoint places uh, houses in that particular case but uh, uh, so much of the, of the uh, public services depend on knowing where things are really really important but on, going on to picture books again some of you may be uh, thinking back to picture books and stories which use maps and look at one, the classic one would be something like Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island and the whole of that book uh, I discovered uh, uh, Treasure Island was inspired by Robert Louis Stevenson getting out a pencil and paper and drawing a picture of an imaginary island and then making up the story around about it what a great teaching idea so uh, moving on, we'll just go outside for a moment, as it were, and if I can just... We do have some, we do have some answers to oh, that right. do, previous do, do, question. Oh, should, we take so, that, should we take those now then? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So um, some people have said that they uh, use their map for just navigating, I guess, now on their mobile phones, where yeah. um, technology has taken over in a way. Um, some people have said that they use it just to travel generally. Um, and someone said they use Uber every day um, and like to look at the map to make sure that on the Uber app, on the, the taxi app, that they're going in the right direction. Um, and right. I would also say that I use it, I've used maps a lot in lockdown when I've been going for walks around my area and discovering new, new trails and new walking ways, so. Mm. A lot of people have, yeah, discovered the area around about them in a way that they never knew. I, I'll share my use of maps, which again, you might think, oh dear, it's a bit sad. But uh, when I watch the weather forecast, because I always want to know what the weather's going to do, I'm, I'm just glued to the satellite map and I can, you know, they give you the overview, but actually you can see the cloud patterns moving across and you can look at your particular point on the map and say, okay, that's fine. It looks as if in this particular part of the world, we'll have some cloud coming in at this time or the sun will break through or whatever. So that's, uh, I'm, I'm glued to the satellite map uh, <laughs> forecasts. Right, um, so moving on to the outdoors, as it were, uh, I think that um, I would argue, and many geographers would argue that it's by getting outside. Geography is learned through the soles of your feet. Now, that may immediately think, oh, well, I can't get outside, but you can. The outside begins on the inside, as it were. It begins in the, in the corridor of the school. It begins certainly in the school grounds and, uh, and the play areas and in the immediate street just outside the school gates. And those children obviously enjoy scrunching on the stones and relating to the place round about them and beginning to invest it with meaning. 
it begins to become significant. Geography uh, is learned through the soles of your feet, and so, in a sense, is your sense of belonging and identity. And I haven't asked Charlene this, but I guess she thinks a little bit differently about, Charlene, I guess you think a little bit differently about where you live uh, as a result of having tramped around it. And you oh, found absolutely. Places, which are a bit magical, a bit special. You didn't yes. know that was there, did you? Yes, I mean, there's so many, I mean, in the past year of being in, in and out of lockdown in the UK, you've, we've come to know our, our local area very much, um, very well now. And yeah, just discovering new areas that was around the corner from me that I didn't even know. So I've got a, a field of cows behind my house and I didn't even realise. So there you go. <laughs> That's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. And I start with eight-year-olds who you take outside the school gate and just look at them and say, what's the name of this road? And they've got no idea. And then you can see the street nameplate that says what the name of the street is. And then you begin to start investigating. That picture there's got a trap of one kind. You see the metal trap. What's underneath that? There are all sorts of services, whether it's water, electricity, gas, and so on, which uh, are buried under the pavement. They enable us, they provide the inputs which enable us to live in our houses and keep us uh, serviced, as it were. So finding out about those is interesting. One of the things which we enjoy doing locally is going out with some big chunky crayons and, and sheets of paper and making rubbings of these traps and gratings because they come out brilliantly. Uh, and uh, then you've got a big wall display, but it's also an introduction to beginning to think, well, okay, well, so where does the water come from? So if you want to trace the passage of the water cycle, for example, and you're talking about the water cycle in science, you can look at it in your local street by saying, well, okay, that raindrop drops onto the top of the roof. Where does it go? Well, it goes uh, into a gutter. It then goes down into a downpipe. It may flow across the pavement. It may go into a, a, a drain. Uh, and then where does it go from there? Well, it will go down eventually uh, to the uh, it'll probably be processed and be fed it back into the sea and then it'll evaporate and come around again. Um, on average raindrops come around, this is a totally tr wonderful trivial fact, uh, they come around about every 2,000 years if it's an average piece of water because that's how long it takes for the full ocean to evaporate and be recycled. So um, yeah, all that uh, in the street just outside and inquiries and investigations in the local environment uh, bring geography to life. Uh, in the textbook, in the Collins Primary Geography, we've got, we organise it on uh, double page spreads and there are three double page spreads per theme and the third spread is always an investigative activity. That investigative activity could just be a survey in the classroom of information which you collect in, uh, by asking children around about you. So you could do, let's say, uh, a very simple level, you might want to do a survey of front door colours and find out which is the most common front door colour. You don't have to go out to do that, you can do that just in the four worlds. That's an investigation, but it leads you to going outside. It leads you to asking questions. This is a, a school in London, in a, a, a deprived area, uh, very close to a very rich area, which is the, uh, 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 the city in the Isle of um, uh, Canary Wharf area. And uh, children, interestingly, paired up with uh, upper junior and uh, 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 lower junior, you see on the right, uh, in pairs, exploring this area, asking questions, thinking about it, noticing things. And uh, the skill is then to uh, build that into a topic uh, which you can then uh, 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 explore an aspect of not just geography, but maybe I would like to think it has a, a strong, clear geography component. Um, this is a, a, a group of uh, children in, in a primary school who uh, looked at their local community uh, and made a survey of their street, that's the street outside the school. You can see the school building in grey at the bottom and then they redesigned it and redesigned it in, in through modelling. Uh, here's a taking action. This is a, a group of children who are walking to school rather than going by car and around these parts of the world the cluster of cars, the traffic jams which develop around schools at uh, uh, about quarter to nine in the morning on a school day. It's absolutely huge. Uh, and of course, we're talking here about the, not only the route the children take, we're talking about the impact that this has on, uh, on reducing carbon. Uh, we can talk about uh, safety and the way in which there are particular dangers and things that which we can maybe, there are opportunities for improvements. 
and things which the children notice that they think ought to be done. You, you expand, you open the door and walk through it as it were, and the world of investigations and inquiries opens up round about you. So three or four little slides just giving a hint towards uh, the enormous importance of investigations. And here's a sequence that we uh, 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 believe makes quite good sense, starting with asking questions, collaborating and selecting what it is, collaborating on the study and uh, selecting what it is you're going to do, the actual activity itself, reflecting on what it is uh, you've discovered and collected and information that you've got, communicating the findings and evaluating their significance. So there's a sort of inquiry skills sequence. And those questions could be your own questions which you've given the children or it could be their questions. Uh, the collaborating and the selecting is deciding things like when are we going to do it, where are we going to do it, how are we going to do it, and so on. How will the information be collected? Uh, you can collect your information photographically, you can collect it in a data form, you can collect it uh, uh, through your own recollections and through notes, you can add it to a map, all sorts of different things. So that question is what is that you've then found out and what have you learned, how has it changed your thinking and if so has you know where does that leave lead you to uh, next so a sequence of inquiry skills which takes you uh, into uh, which can be undertaken at all sorts of different levels so finally a, a one final pause for collections have you used your school grounds and the local area for inquiries and investigations of any time or if you haven't can you think of ways uh, which you'd like to uh, uh, having maybe spinning off uh, what I'm saying here. And the context, uh, it all has to do with local context and local opportunities, but um, every school has opportunities for uh, using the grounds. And if we can get children out and about uh, in one form or another, uh, finding out more about the world and interacting, uh, learning doesn't only have to happen within the four world walls of a classroom. It happens in all sorts of, in fact, most learning, a lot of learning doesn't happen within the four walls of the classroom, just as uh, uh, a lot of learning happens throughout life and not just in, uh, in, in the formal years of education. So I think uh, broadening out uh, our concept of schooling and education and links with the community and getting the people from the community into the classroom uh, to talk about what uh, they're doing is, an, is another really rich theme which uh, geography perhaps has the opportunity to explore and to develop rather more than most other subjects. Is there anything we're picking up there, Charlene, on the chat? Or um, not at the moment, but okay. Um, okay. Yeah, we can. If you are thinking about it, just put it in the chat box, and we can refer back to it later if anyone has anything to add. Right. So just to sort of finish off, as it were, some thoughts on curriculum organisation. And again, there is a huge amount we could say about this, but there's a big drive in Britain and in other parts of the world as well, I think, towards core knowledge. And core knowledge is great. We need to have our knowledge. Uh, one of the Ofsted reports for Britain talked about how uh, secondary school children were learning about uh, uh, the deforestation of the Amazon, but had no idea that the Amazon was in South America. So that idea of locational knowledge is really important. And uh, they're some of the things we need to know, not only facts about places or where they are, what they're called, and the specialist vocabulary that goes along with it. So if you're doing something on transport, you might want to have uh, a word of specialist vocabulary for that. It might be rush hour or uh, that might be pedestrianisation, those sort of words, which you, as, you, as you introduce children to that vocabulary, it develop, helps them uh, develop their thinking. On the other side, uh, making links and connections, bringing your own understanding and ideas and emotional involvement and opinions into, in, into your learning, developing a, frame, a bigger framework and uh, uh, underpinning it by uh, your values and what you believe matters. That's important too. And then those two things, the reflection and action and core knowledge need to be balanced. And as I say there, facts on their own become, or run the danger of just becoming dislocated facts, just gobbets of information, what I call pub quiz geography. Reflection on its own, on its own is absolutely uh, uh, useful, but it lacks rigour and understanding. You, know, you need the knowledge to feed into the reflection, and you need the reflection to feed back into the knowledge. And so it's a seesaw. 
So you can see knowledge without reflection is disjointed, lacks, uh, and lacks a framework. Uh, reflection without knowledge is, emphasizes opinion and can be superficial and might be uh, rudely called taxi job, uh, taxi driver geography. So a balance uh, to be struck between knowledge and reflection and understanding and uh, how you pitch that depends partly on your circumstances and partly on the demands of your curriculum. Uh, but uh, I would think, I would want to argue that uh, it, it's because it's easier to, uh, to focus on the knowledge, there's a danger that the knowledge side uh, of, the, of the seesaw is a little bit too heavily weighted. Uh, geographical thinking can be structured uh, and is best structured around a conceptual framework. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about what that conceptual framework, what are the big concepts of geography, but place and knowing about places is important because that's what it, our subject is about. Uh, the spaces uh, between places and the way that they interconnect is really important and the scale local to global is really important. And so there are lots of uh, questions which come out of this. If you look at place, what's the place called? What's it like? How's it changing? How do I feel about it? If you think of the spatial dimension, where is this place? How's it connected? How can it be mapped? And if you think about the scale, well, how does this place compare with other places? And that's the local global. But uh, as well as place, scale and space, there are a whole lot of other concepts which are, uh, help us to structure our thinking around geography. Four ones which I think are really important are movement, pattern, change and interaction. And those play out in all sorts of different ways. So movement happens within the school and patterns of movement that happen there. Equally, it happens in global shipping and aviation. Patterns, times of the day, sometimes it's busy, sometimes it's not. Patterns on maps. Change, the world's changing all around us all the time and constantly evolving. And one of the problems that we've got in geography and one of the things that make it exciting at the same time is keeping up to date. And the interaction, interaction of people and people, people and places, people and their circumstances and environment. Those are playing out in all the time and constantly uh, it's, a, it's a kaleidoscope as, uh, as we move forward in time, uh, those uh, concepts play out in different ways. So progression in primary geography, lots of ways of representing it. Um, so two key axes here, the range of study and the depth of study. And this takes Brunner's spiral curriculum, and, but argues that the local and the global should be represented at both uh, at all levels, whether you're working with uh, three or four year olds or whether you're working at undergraduate or postgraduate level. The local and the global is, is looping up. So they've got that main spiral and then you've got uh, a, a taxonomy, which is derived from Bloom, I think, where you start with naming and recognizing things, the naming of parts, to describing, comparing, explaining, curricularly, uh, critiquing, evaluating, and analyzing. So there are different ways of representing uh, progression in geography, uh, uh, but uh, recognizing that the breadth uh, needs to be combined with the depth is one way of talking about it. Quality geography lessons, well, uh, we could, again, we could have a big checklist. I've just put uh, a dozen things up here, which you might want to bear in mind. Multiple entry points so that children can learn in different ways is very helpful. Uh, the, your uh, uh, understanding of the subject and your uh, awareness of not only children's misconceptions, but also uh, the general professional wisdom to do with pedagogy, those will make a big difference. Uh, making learning creative and enjoyable. I spent a lot of my time talking about how geography is a really creative subject because it's constantly evolving. Balancing core knowledge with personal feelings. That's the seesaw that we've just seen in that diagram. Giving children the chance to use their own ideas so that it's not just filling empty vessels as it were, but giving children the chance to take control of their learning. Uh, inquiry questions and the focus on concepts. Outdoor learning and field work, one kind or another, the soles of your feet, focusing on the local and the wider world, challenging stereotypes and tackling controversial issues. Geography does deal with controversial issues and it needs to, and we have a duty, as it were, to see that we do take them on board and give children uh, a chance to engage critically uh, and a, a wonderful forum in schools to engage unemotionally 
for some of the issues which are uh, uh, playing out, uh, rather uh, uh, highly charged issues which are playing out in the world around us. And at the moment, migration and refugees might be one of those. Enabling children to analyze their findings using uh, graphical means. This is geography, maps, charts, diagrams, etc., and making links with other areas of the curriculum. So I've just got two more slides after this, which take us into the resources or to take advantage of opportunities and presentations and displays. Yeah. Two more slides. One is geographical association membership is really useful. You can have, be a free member. You can be at a primary level. You can just be a free member of the association and uh, uh, receive the newsletter and, and various uh, alerts, as it were, to things which are going into the geography world. But primary, if you're, if you pay as a member, of the, uh, pay up for the, join the association as a full member, you, among other things, get a discount on all the publications and primary geography, which I think is an absolutely brilliant uh, journal that sets a very high standard indeed, and comes out uh, three times a year. Be coming out, we're into issue well, on that, uh, well over issue 100 now, so uh, it's been coming out for the last 30 years. And books and resources which you might find useful from a curriculum planning and so on point of view. Uh, well, this is the GA Handbook, Geography Association Handbook, which will be particularly useful if you're a subject leader leading primary geography. And as we say, it's the essential handbook for all teachers. There is no other book like it. Uh, a, a new book from Anne Dolan, uh, which picks up on the idea of curriculum making and powerful primary geography, a toolkit for the 20th century, first century. Anne is a very enthusiastic teacher from Ireland, and she's got lots and lots of uh, material in that book, and just won an award. And a book which I've worked on with Paula Owens called Teaching Primary Geography, which is uh, uh, takes a, a blow by blow account, as it were, of the English national curriculum requirements and provides a range of suggestions and teaching ideas, as well as background knowledge. People uh, welcome the background knowledge, uh, but there are 30 uh, different topics, 10 for uh, uh, lower juniors, 10 for upper juniors and 10 for key stage one, which explore in depth uh, the curriculum and gives full absolutely full coverage of the curriculum as it is at the moment. So three titles, and that is me finished for the PowerPoint, but I think, Charlene, we've got a little bit of time for questions. Yes, absolutely. So um, before we go on to questions, I just want to say thank you very much, Stephen, for taking us through that brilliant presentation. I think a lot of people have taken stuff away from this and will be able to implement it into their classroom. Um, we do have, I don't know if you want to bring up our contact details <clears throat> at the bottom of the screen. So Thank if you, you for reminding me, <laughs> that's OK. <laughs> if anyone is interested in taking a look at our primary geography series or any of our atlases that we have available for schools, then do drop me a line at collins.international at harpercollins.co.uk. Um, and we'll be able to send you some samples um, so that you can take a look at those. Also, if you do have any questions that you don't think about now that you want to pose to Stephen or myself, then do email me um, on that address below. And um, just another quick thing that we are doing more webinars up until the end of May, actually. So do check out our website, collins.co.uk forward slash webinars to take a look at what else we've got in store. Okay, so I'm going to move on to questions now. Um, one that we've got here is, is geography best taught as a single subject or in cross-curricular topics at primary? Both, I think. Uh, you, uh, I'm not going to vote one way or the other. I mean, I think the, <clears throat> the big architecture is that at key stage one or with children aged five, six, uh, integrated uh, themes and topics is, is perceived wisdom and it has been for generations, uh, integrated learning for the very young ones. And, and as we get up to secondary school and, and beyond, uh, uh, single subject teaching. So it is the middle years of childhood where you get that crossover. Geography draws uh, from lots of different subjects and links to lots of different subjects. Uh, and we do need to be able to identify the geography. Personally, I like the a more integrated approach. I think it, it, it makes better sense. It's the sort of learning which perhaps is going to be more, more useful as we move into the 21st century, where 
uh, uh, there's a danger of siloed learning, but equally I recognize the value of <clears throat> a clear lens and a clear perspective which you can get through a single subject. So I think both, but cross-curricular opportunities are certainly uh, well worth exploiting, whether you're single teaching or topic teaching. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that answer, Stephen. Um, another question that I had actually was, um, what has changed in geography teaching since the pandemic? Like, how has that changed the, the way that people have been? Interesting to know. Yeah, we don't really know. Uh, it's playing out at the moment. But uh, if you're teaching online, uh, then clearly that's going to make a, a, a difference to the way that you go about it. I would want to argue that even if you're teaching online, you can still get uh, build in practical activities and get children to do things uh, uh, which involve going out and even looking through the window, even if you're just looking through the window. Uh, I run an entire course in January uh, for trainee teachers, uh, which was called Outdoor Learning. And we were suddenly hit by the lockdown and uh, we had to do all our outdoor learning indoors. So we said, we're not asking you even to leave your room, but if you look out of the window, if you access, you know, sort of, you can begin to start on outdoor learning and uh, that can be supported by literature. There's a lovely book, for example, by somebody called Jeannie Baker called uh, The Window or whatever, or, and Belonging is one of the other ones, uh, which takes precisely that theme. And uh, or equally that little lad who wrote that poem about his imaginative journey. So uh, yes, it's, online learning is going to change things, uh, but it doesn't mean that you can't do the practical. That's a sort of partial answer to that question. No problem, brilliant. Um, another question we've had is um, tips on teaching geography to children where English isn't necessarily their first or second language, how to... Um, yes, yeah. <clears throat> well, I think that one of the great things about geography is that it is geographia, that it is, it is graphical, so that there's the opportunity for a, a, a map, for example, if you take the view of the map as a picture, then it doesn't require uh, too much language skills if it's coming out of your head. That's, so there's the opportunity to represent information graphically, and that might be numbers and things like that. No, uh, one of the things about the Atlas, the Common Search Junior Atlas, is people have said to me repeatedly, this is brilliant for teaching maths, because on every page there is mathematical information, data of one kind or another, gets around the language problem. So uh, I think geography is a good subject, uh, got, uh, uh, and it can be, a lot of it can be presented uh, uh, without, well, clearly vocabulary is really important, but uh, it can be presented to pupils whose English is not necessarily their first language in a way that motivates them and makes sense. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, okay, so I think we're, we've come to the hour now. So um, thank you very much for joining us and thank you, Stephen, for taking us through that. And can I um, thank everybody myself because it's wonderful to have uh, uh, the opportunity to share some ideas. Yes, it's been lovely to have lots of people from all over the world. So thank you so much and we hope to see you in future webinars.